<laughs> All right, hello everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Greg Downing, and this is Eric Hansen. See if and, this works, and I think it does. Yeah, and we are X Res. We kind of operate as a pair. It's kind of Siamese twin kind of thing. We try not to get too close to each other, but so we'll uh, we'll just kind of trade off talking about different uh, aspects of our work. Um, one thing I guess, in maybe an opening, is that we we tend to be very uh, digital about our work, and I know that we have uh, uh, film, you know, tr uh, practitioners here as well as digital. Um, so we, but we both came from film backgrounds uh, for decades, really. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but a lot of what we'll show you today will be very, of course, digitally based. As far as different kind of research and things we're trying to explore, is there any way to get the house lights down a hair? Or? Um, do you want to talk about this, Greg? Sure. Uh, well, when we first start started our company, uh, we wanted to expl explore the area of, uh, that's emerging of computational photography use our skills from visual effects and um, use our skills as photographers. Uh, both of us have been uh, uh, photographers for qu quite a while. Um, a lot of you may know me from the various lists related to panoramic stitching uh, for years. Um, but what we wanted to do was embrace these new computational photography techniques um, and come up with efficient methodologies for uh, doing production um, and to integrate all the VFX and uh, 3D uh, 3D work and compositing that, that we've worked in uh, in film for years. Um, we all wanted to take these skills and then reapply these to areas that, that had not previously benefited from uh, visual effects and these, these different technologies. Uh, so we want to focus on natural sciences, uh, cultural heritage projects, and similar projects. Uh, ultimately, uh, after blowing up New York City about three times each, uh, we decided we wanted to do something that, that mattered you know, more than just the summer spectacle. Yeah, Hollywood visual effects work is a great, uh, this was just a slide of some of the shows that we worked on, but um, a lot of the skills that we utilized in film was about creating environments and creating imagery for backgrounds. So it kind of uh, was hand in hand with panoramic uh, imaging and so forth. But uh, when Greg and I met several years ago, we found we had complementary skill sets. I'm a little more heavy on the 3D animation side and Greg's uh, heavier on the photography side and photogrammetry. So we kind of combine those two, but like I say, this is a—it's been a great, a lot of fun working on these shows. But after a while, it is kind of like the, you know, one too many Roland Emmerich movies, um, you know. And I think 2012 was probably the penultimate destruction film, and we didn't work on that one. But it was glad to see other people do that. Uh, but anyway, as we began, I think we we wanted actually to initially create digital assets, leasable assets for the uh, film industry, which would combine both 3D geometry as well as high resolution backgrounds. We didn't actually, as I say, Greg was probably in diapers when he was thinking about gigapixel photography. Yeah, I think we had slightly um, different motivations. Yeah, I think that. so. Eric was more for digital sets, and I had always taken panoramas and was always a little disappointed at the detail I got when I did big vistas. Um, I'd been doing lots of panoramas, and, and I just never had that feeling that I got when I took photograph the vista, you know, with just like, you know, six or seven 20 millimeter shots. and. Once we went to Gigapixel, all of a sudden I was like, oh, this is what impressed me about the location. So that was my motivation for going after Gigapixel. Yeah, mine was a little more commercial probably yeah. in, <laughs> in nature. But the idea of creating a digital uh, asset, a representation of a digital location, because in commercials and in feature film, they shoot a lot of the same locations around Los Angeles over and over again. Uh, but anyway, as we got into that and we explored it, we looked at the kind of lensing that a director of photography would use within a spherical panoramic image, and it kind of reverse engineered us into Gigapixel. So to be able to really say, here's a digital background that kind of can be uh, substituted for live action photography, you would have to go escalate to that level of resolution. So that's really how this started. Um, although we never really did the, uh, the whole digital set thing. We just got too enamored with this whole process. Um, we started doing this in uh, about 2005. The other thing we wanted to do, there had been gigapixel work before that, of course, we did nowhere close to inventing this, but the, uh, we wanted to take it out of an academic exercise and into a real production methodology that could be used for real projects. So that was uh, always kind of our goal, is kind of working it into making it you know, production ready and efficient. Yeah, mostly. So, so that we could do hundreds of them versus mm -hmm. dozens or something. Yeah. Because our first were very labor intensive, our, fir our first one. For us, I mean, other people had done it too, but I think our first one took us months 
So uh, you know now now there it's we're not nearly that months long. to stitch. Yeah, months to stitch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, but we and we've continued along, and we'll show you a variety of different applications. We just start out on Gigapixel because that's what we're known for. But uh, at this point now, we're still using and still using Gigapixel heavily, but. We're exploring different media types and other kind of technologies that we'll show you today. Um, we're going to quickly move through this, though, and we do want to spend half the talk at least talking about the Yosemite project that we did a, uh, two years ago, I think, two and a half or so. And this was uh, our biggest, our most ambitious project uh, with photography. Um, our biggest image is a measly 12 gigapixel compared to the beautiful Paris image out there, and uh, you know, so we haven't gotten it. We haven't engaged in this uh, uh, this biggest picture of the world thing, but, uh, but it's great to see that now there's some really magnificent images coming online. Uh, we started off actually with a relationship with Peace River Studios on the East Coast, and they had a device, they had film production background. They also came out of MIT Media Lab, and they developed this uh, motion control rig. It was actually designed for a dolly system, uh, pan tilt head, but they, because they were, uh, again, kind of more of an R&D company, they developed it where it could be used for still photography and be able to be indexed around a sphere. So we, uh, we got a great relationship with them and they provided this equipment to us in the early days and uh, because there really was nothing on the market. And, uh, but anyway, we, we used some of our uh, knowledge of 3D animation to kind of build the programming of what that sphere would be if we took it up to gigapixel resolution. So this is just an example of some of the programs we'd have to write little scripts that would drive this motorized or programmable yeah. head. And the, the, one of the great, what you see on the right is, is uh, basically you can use Maya or any other 3D program as a camera simulator. So you can put it in the focal length and you can see, see the camera frustrum and all these types of things. So what you see is a whole bunch of squares put together to make a sphere and that's how we programmed our first sphere. Uh, this is our first one, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, it's our um, first one. Sphere. And this was just an image that uh, they got some airplay early on, but it, again, I was showing insets of what the one-to-one -one is. Now, I'm not going to bore all of this and just show a lot of gigapixel stuff, because, we, you know, we all, I think this is many years old now. Um, this is, we did end up uh, using the Klaus Rodeon unit, which is from Germany. And this is one thing, we, we had trouble backpacking or hiking with this. <laughs> this is not a, an yeah. easy device. Um, so we, luckily, uh, Dr. Uh, Klaus brought this unit out, and this was relatively compact, a bit heavy, but, uh, you know, we'd find unwilling suspects to load it into their backpacks yeah. um, <laughs> with a few more rocks in addition, you know. <laughs> but, but anyway, this ended up being our workhorse unit for years, and, of course, now today, actually just now, um, we have the Gigapan Pro, Epic Pro that just came out, as well as Color, I think, is releasing a unit. So now there's some really great alternatives yeah, yeah. Uh, to this. This is still a very expensive unit, but for uh, very high-end applications, this is still a, a very robust unit. Yeah, and you can see here, we also use it for doing panoramas that are non-spherical as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, and this image was one that we, we got a lot of airplay for early on the net. Um, we released this, we were, I think we were the first to show Gigapixel online in the Google Map format, yeah. which at that time was... Uh, you know, one of the few tile-based viewers yeah. that you could and go initially, the like I think we saw a lot of early Zoomify uh, panoramas, but Zoomify had a uh, limitation of the uh, four gig TIFF file size, so that for us that was a big barrier to overcome that. And we did that using the Google Maps API. Of course, now there are plenty of uh, solutions. Yeah, we've moved on a long time ago after yeah, there's over that. some fantastic new stuff. Um, the, the funny thing about when we put this out there, just a little side story, is that we got a tremendous amount of visitation, I don't know, a few hundred thousand an hour or something when this released. And what we did is we looked at the statistics and we looked who was kind of hitting on our data the hardest. And there was two enterprises. One was Microsoft. And uh, eventually they came forward about a week or two later. And I, I know Howard Good is in here. Yeah, and he uh, is, yeah. <laughs> and said, by the way, we're doing gigapixel research too. <laughs> and uh, boy, you got great data there. So. And we were like, oh, that's what you want to see the and, <laughs> But the, the, number, the other one we never heard from, and that was the U.S. military. Yeah, so we have no idea what they were doing. Anyway. I think they're having a conference next door. They're probably <laughs> yeah, yeah. showing it right now. <laughs> Uh, this is just showing uh, the biggest lens that we've used so far, and this is the uh, Canon 600. We're Canon shooters, and uh, this was our biggest, our 12 uh, gigapixel from Grand Canyon. Uh, we don't have it online yet, but it's a monster image, and that's using the Rodeon with the 600, and it was a beast to uh, deal with this shot. 
Uh, the other great thing about uh, what we're trying to do, though, is put cameras in unusual places. So uh, we enjoy a little bit of outdoor adventuring. So uh, really nice to be able to rappel down and then anchor into, uh, yeah. say, a wall. For uh, Because these are programmable units, we can, you know, Greg drop down and we control it via Bluetooth on the ground, which is kind of fun. Um, we also do a lot with pole mounts. And this was our early pole mount, which is a single pole with lanyards and this was actually very scary because on the other side of that cliff it's about a two to three thousand foot drop down into a Norwegian fjord and uh, that was a little dicey putting ten thousand dollars up on this pole but uh, but one early thing and then we eventually narrowed it into basically a very large tripod with three yeah. sticks and that was a lot easier to erect yeah. and uh, deal we, with. We just made this out of uh, we ordered flag poles off from eBay so these are you know, this is actually a pretty inexpensive large tripod. Yeah, it's actually a great... It, yeah, really lightweight great. aluminum. Uh -huh. It's easy to build. So. And uh, if any of you have an interest, I can tell you the kind of hardware that we use at the top. Um, anyway, of course, then there's viewing. I don't know if we want to go talk too much about this. Uh, we, we can talk about this. I mean, other than, you know, there's lots of different ways you can view these. Uh, 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 and now you can, the latest ones are Photosynth now can, can view it, which... Uh, uses the deep zoom technology, which is really fantastic. Silverlight, um, uh, Gigapan's website will will do that for you. Um, okay, we right. have Flash, KR Pano. Um, there's Ajax solutions. You can view it in, in Google Earth. Um, basically, now there's almost a dozen different ways to view this, and, and so we're seeing some really fantastic viewer technology. And if you're not familiar with this, what it does is uh, you can see a lot of examples of this on our site, but if you, it, it kind of racks through a series of tiles of nested resolutions, but smoothly transitioning between them. So as you uh, ask the, uh, the app to zoom into an image, it makes a seamless zoom transition, when, when in fact you're only loading what is the JPEG content of what's seen on a single screen. So you're never loading the whole image uh, in RAM in any way. And these are some of the, oh, I'm sorry, I made this slide a little erroneously and blocking some things. But uh, we've been a big fan of HD View for years, which of course Howard has uh, is authored. And uh, uh, Silverlight is a really tremendous viewer. Uh, we currently have KR Pano on the site and we're tooling up for Silverlight. Uh, we do have HD View as well on the site. Okay. Um, also, we, we, we obviously one thing when you look at a large image online, I'm sure every one of you have, but um, it's an interesting exercise. But you don't you kind of get a feel for the resolution that's in there, but you don't really feel it all at once. And what we found is that when you print, you really can feel every pixel. And of course, this is representative of the wonderful prints that are uh, in the gallery uh, at this event. But uh, just to be able to feel that. So um, this we've had a lot of fun with, and uh, uh, this is our first one done with an Epson large format, but done, th the question of course is how do you mount extremely large prints? And I think we all struggle with this. We still haven't found the ultimate yeah. way to do this. This is definitely the most difficult and uh, most expensive part of the process, surprisingly. The printing is actually nothing. It's yeah. incredibly inexpensive. Yeah, and you can get some beautiful mounting. print. Now. So this is a custom frame that I designed and we tried for a while. I'm not sure if I'm going to keep using this, but this was in, done in 44 inch width uh, panels. You can barely see the seam, but uh, that are kind of uh, aligned to each other. And the nice thing about this, we could put a curve, a slight bend in it. Um, we did acquire a HP 60 inch uh, large format, and this has been our workhorse printer now. And so we kind of run wild with that. We're going to show you one of the big ones here at the end of the talk, uh, but this is the biggest we've done, which is 40 feet by five feet by 300 DPI. So it's uh, just a tremendous amount of resolution and you can literally take 20 minutes to walk the yeah. print. Uh, that, that was one of the things we discovered when we started showing these prints was normally people kind of walk up to a print and you know they look at it for maybe a minute or two and they move on. But with these gigapixel prints and especially with uh, something like Yosemite that people are somewhat familiar with, they'll go in and they'll look at a trail and they'll start following that trail across the print. And you'll see people spend 20 minutes looking at a single print. Um, if it's, if and one it's thing, I'll, I'll make this recommendation to you. This is one thing we found. We've done a few trade shows with this and uh, to try to pitch our services. And one thing we'd find is that if seen at a distance, it looks like a bad 70s mural, basically. Um, but if you, so a lot of people will stay yeah. back. Yeah, because everybody's seen big images. We all look yeah. at billboards. We all see big images all the time. We're just not used to 
getting closer to them and being able to see more. So what we do is we hang, we discovered if you hang magnifying glasses uh, down in front of the print, people go, why is there a magnifying yeah. glass there yeah. on a bad 70s mural? And then they'll walk up and then they'll gasp yeah. and they'll Or another thing you could do it. is you could put footprints on, on the carpet or something walking up yeah. to it. Just some indicator that they should be getting closer. Yeah, that's right. That's something we would recommend. Um, we were lucky because we were able to do, uh, I think there's a lot to be done here um, as far as exhibition. Um, obviously the show we have here at this event is fantastic. Um, but to do a gigapixel show, this I, I'm not sure if this is the very first one, but we did this last year in Norway. We do a lot of work over in Norway. And uh, in this case we, uh, we had a lot of fun. We had two other photographers that we work with, uh, local in Norway and they're shooting Gigapixel now. So we did a big uh, uh, event with this, which came out really nice. So this is, I think, a new thing that can be uh, capitalized in, in the uh, gallery Yeah, uh, but you space. need a lot of space, that's the trick. Yeah, You're and it still really has to look crowds. professionally mounted, and as I say, this is the thing that's that the we're, we're yeah. really always trying to work on. Um, we're not gonna uh, bog you down with too much of this, but we do because we do visual effects, we've looked at a lot of interesting ways to combine Gigapixel with visual effects. So. Um, again, it's mostly just the image can become a background for virtual cinematography, so you can kind of do uh, cinematic camera work within the image. Now, it's not the same as shooting on a dolly or a crane or jib or anything because there's no parallax, of course, in a single image, but you can pan, tilt, and zoom. And uh, a lot of the imagery that we do in these big feature films actually are done that way uh, with just the, that simple you know, shooting on sticks, lock-off camera. Um, but anyway, so this is an alternative to traditional shooting. Um, and then we also integrate a lot of uh, digital terrain data, which is a specialty of mine, and this is using data that was gathered from the space shuttle. A lot of you know about this, I'm sure, but this is just a way of, it's basically a uh, uh, landscape modeling or terrain modeling that you can readily download. Um, we paid for it, so it's all there online for us, which is great. And uh, we have ways of taking that grayscale image and bumping it up into a 3D uh, model. And of course, when you do that, by itself it's great, but then what if you merge it with a gigapixel image? So here's just a section of a gigapixel, and then there's the 3D data that's been registered with the background. And of course, once you do that, it can open up a lot of things. This is within our 3D software, and it's just showing how in the process of aligning, where you have this low res representation of the train and eventually going to match into the background. Of course, once you do that, you can do all kinds of unethical things like change the weather <laughs> or change or do anything to this. We showed, we gave this talk to the local Sierra Club in, uh, in Los Angeles once, and yeah. we had a lot of we people gasp. We yeah, a lot slide. of hissing when we <laughs> talked about changing the weather. But nonetheless, from a visual effects standpoint, uh, this is kind of part and parcel of what you would do. The interesting thing is like if you flood this with artificial water, as you raise the water line, it'll find the shoreline properly because it's actually a hybrid image now. There's 3D behind the 2D. And that's kind of uh, intriguing anyway. Um, and then you'll, we'll show you our little uh, demo reel, a little animation reel at the end, and that'll have some of this time lapse in there. And you'll see it'll look like a very large dolly move going into this time lapse. And what we're actually doing is we're mapping it to the 3D uh, terrain and then uh, making new camera moves. And that's, I think, uh, uh, not been done, so that's kind of fun. Okay, you want to talk about full Yeah, sure. Um, so we've also been, um, you know, as... Uh, I, I heard the reference that there are spinners and framers uh, in, in the audience today. So uh, this, this is something that will probably be especially a, of a special interest to the spinners, the, the people who do Not full spinners, spherical yeah. imagery, um, because there's this uh, emerging format um, that's called full dome theater. And in this format, uh, they're primarily uh, converted planetariums, where the planetarium has been converted. They've removed the old uh, star projectors from the center of the room. They put seats in there now. And then they uh, take a whole series of uh, cinema quality video projectors and they'll stitch multiple video projectors, same way we stitch images, uh, onto the inside of the dome. So then you have a hemispherical space where you can see all the way around you. But you've got really high quality, high resolution imagery uh, wherever you look. And it's, it's really the ideal way to look at a spherical photograph. It, it gives the strongest sense that I've ever experienced of being there, being in the place. Um, so there's a great opportunity now to create uh, films and interactive experiences uh, for these dome theaters. Um, so let me, this is... Let me inject yeah. one thing. It may be the, actually the antithesis to the framer 
because there's yeah, no frame there is anymore. No frame. It's really yeah. just bringing you back experientially to where you shot, yeah, right. um, which maybe some thought about. Right, that. right, right. Um, so this is uh, what you're looking at is a um, uh, stereographic projection of a spherical image taken inside a dome theater uh, during an interactive presentation. So we're interactively navigating through the panoramas, taking questions from the audience, zooming in on different portions. Um, here we've got, uh, this is a way we visualize uh, the panoramas um, inside our 3D package, uh, inside Maya. And then this will, uh, well, do you want to show it now? I guess we could just show a few seconds of this now. This is a, so anyway, we got started, uh, we, we were in partnership with a photographer, Vance Howard, who's a very excellent piano photographer from Boulder. And uh, he's a big uh, Grand Canyon river rat, as it were and uh, really wants to create a film uh, talking about the conservation of the Grand Canyon and the great you know, fight that was fought in the 60s for that with David Brower and others. So we've, uh, we've partnered up with him to do this film um, and we're seeking funding, seeking support, so it's kind of a long road, but we're doing a lot of great little tests along the way. And uh, anyway, so we created, uh, we said, well, let's just take some of our existing photography and do a, a test short uh, just to see how the production's gonna go. So we did this thing. We ended up kind of calling it, a, giving it a title and submitting it to a, a film festival. Um, it's not terribly narrative, but there's some, some uh, uh, interesting imagery on here. And what I can do, do you want to talk about the uh, flash player? Sure, sure. So we've been using uh, uh, KR Pano, and one of the features in the beta of KR Pano is uh, spherical video. So you can actually put... Uh, video in there Actually, and interactively show. navigate it. This is on our website, by the way. You can go, come and look at any of these uh, on our website. And uh, you're gonna show that one first. Okay. Yeah, I'll show you just to show the concept. So th this is actually a, another project we did. So you can see that he's interacting with it on our. This is off our website. Now this is equal rectangular uh, imagery, but you're seeing it uh, animated. Yeah. Um, but the nice thing is we can change uh, perspective on the image as we go and uh, interact with that. So yeah. this is a, a new feature in KR, which yeah. is just terrific. And what, what you're looking at, this is a, just a brief aside here, this is a, a virtual reality project we did for the uh, national parks um, to help the, tell the story of the Wright brothers, one of the early flights of the Wright brothers. Um, and uh, the way the story is told is the um, guests to the park come out with a ranger and the ranger hands them these VR goggles. They put on these VR goggles and they actually experience the flight and they can turn and, and look around inside this uh, video panorama. And this has other panoramic uh, implications as well because we used panoramas to create the visual effects that then we re-rendered out into uh, spherical video panoramas. Is that done from a single point of view? Uh, we took panoramas from single points of view, reprojected them back onto geometry, uh, created specialized textures, added 3D elements. And yeah, as you could see in that, we were actually flying through the space uh, afterwards. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm not gonna play the whole thing, it's about five minutes, but this is uh, applying it now to the Planetarium Dome. So this is our film uh, in uh, Glendale Community College, which is the dome we work with. But again, being able to interact, let's see if I can get this mic off, you can hear the audio a little bit. The projector's a little crushed. Are you wanna get that? Okay. Um, but the nice thing about this, so this is the way the audience perceives the film, but you can kind of feel the dome, but as you look down here we can see the seating. So it's a way to, because it's really difficult to show this uh, in a normal, what's called the Dome Master, which is a fisheye format. So this is a perspective corrected viewer that, uh, uh, that allows you to get a bit of an idea of what it's like to, to go back in and of course we can change this. And we develop a technique to take stills, but to do perspective, uh, or rather uh, dolly moves in this, so there's actually parallax in some of these shots. But here, this is, uh, you may know, ancient art in the Fisher Towers in Moab, outside of Moab, and uh, you just can't convey the height of this with a flattened image, so this is really great for dome. And this is, of course, Angel's Landing at, at Zion. And this has a tilt on there because it is a horizontal dome, so we artificially tilt the horizon up, um, et cetera. But, this is really just a transition uh, between many different panoramic images. But again, I offer this to you because if you have spherical imagery, this is a very uh, direct application of it in a new and kind of powerful uh, media. Okay. 
Anyway, this so is on the, our website. The, if you want to look the, almost the entire film is made up of spherical panoramas, and a lot of that kind of reprojected onto geometry. So we uh, looked at the panorama, we recreated the geometry that you could see in the panorama, and then if you could think of the same way you, you would might take a slide and project an image, in 3D it projects the image back onto that geometry. And that allowed us to do things like move the camera to make it a little more dynamic. And quick time, you know, I'm just not enjoying Windows a whole lot these days. I'm going to uh, try to kill this off. These are downloadable on your website. Yeah, you can look at all this. I was going to show you the, uh, um, let me just restart master. this. The Dome Master, which is again, but I'm afraid to <laughs> with Windows. So let's uh, go back to the slides. But nonetheless, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very different uh, appearance. And it's really hard to understand. Uh, again, yeah, it's, just, a, it's just hard image. for most people to read a fisheye image and know how that will translate into dome theater. You want to talk about your yeah, thing? sure. So um, recently, uh, so this this area of dome theater is advancing uh, really rapidly. Um, so the world's and a lot of it is happening right now in China. It's in really incredible what's happening there. They are uh, they've got the world's highest resolution dome theaters. All three of the world's highest resolution dome theaters. All of them are in China. And that's 8K by 8K, so, so it's just a monumental... 8,000 8, pixel by 8,000 pixel dome. So they've got something like 53 megapixels projection. I think that's right. I think it's 53. Um, so that's going up at 60 frames per second, or up to 60 frames per second. We rendered ours at 24. And in addition to that, in Macau, which this is, in, this is the dome theater uh, in Macau. It's an IMP building. Um, they're also doing it stereoscopically. So they have twice the number of projectors, you wear 3D glasses, you see the whole thing in stereoscopic 3D. Um, so um, they they built these incredible domes now, but they have no material <laughs> to show in these, these show off this really incredible projection envi environment. So we were invited to uh, uh, do a kind of a special test case with our film because we, everything we shot was based on panoramas that are actually much higher resolution than that. Uh, it was very easy for us to kind of just reproject a higher resolution image and because we had the geometry we could do the stereoscopic offset. Um, and uh, so we did an, a, a single shot out of our film in this 8K format and went to China to show it. Great. Uh, well, just, well, let's get to Yosemite in a second, but real quick, um, this is another thing that we've kind of branched into, and this is more for cultural heritage work, um, which we have a passion for, but uh, this is using two things, multispectral imaging, which is infrared and other ways to uh, alter uh, uh, a spectrum, and then also reflectance mapping, uh, otherwise known as PTM, the, uh, the geek term for that is polynomial texture mapping, but I would never say that in a talk like this. <laughs> <laughs> but do uh, but you want to describe that, Greg? Sure. Well, um, the, okay. And well, well, here's the, talk about the, this is just the, uh, the D-Stretch first. Sure. So this is uh, an application called D-Stretch, and this is used for cultural heritage research. And it actually is working with a color image, and it, it takes the matrix, it, it creates a matrix uh, lookup table of the color that allows you to basically see more detail that is captured in the color but the visual hum, human visual system just doesn't uh, pick up so it allows you to kind of manipulate color so if any of you are interested in, in playing with rock art this is uh, well, yeah and the nice thing about this is you can see the different types of uh, dye that was used so it can extract that from what you would think would be normally a monochromatic uh, application and then also this is the the Sinbad panel of course in Utah and this has had a lot of uh, weather uh, degradation on the left side from a water uh, runoff uh, adjacent. So it's really eroded um, one of those uh, figures. But now D-Stretch can really recover that. So in any kind of and this is a uh, this is a freeware application. It's uh, uh, written by John. Uh, I think I have his name somewhere. I forget. But a tremendous little uh, uh, piece of uh, software. But this is the kind of the main thing we've concentrated on. This is called PTM. Uh, okay, so this is a, the PTM uh, capture technique. So the capture technique for this is to uh, take basically hemispherical lighting, um, and it's important that you uh, keep the light the same distance from the subject for all of the photographs. That's why there are two lasers attached uh, to the top of the flash. But we take a basically a, a series of hemispherical images, and you can see there's a, in the lower right hand corner there's a little eight ball that we use to extract the, the uh, uh, position of the flash when we took the photograph. And this allows us to relight 
the image virtually uh, after the fact. So this is uh, very powerful for people who are researching uh, rock art. Okay, and also we can change the surface material. So now we change it to a specular material so that we can see more uh, detail uh, in the carvings. But what this allows researchers to do is they can do the same thing they would do on the site. Because one of the ways that they that they will work is that they'll come to a location at night when there's no competing light, and they'll hold a flashlight at an extreme angle and just kind of move it so that they can see the the because some of the carving is will be really worn out. It takes a lot of work to see that detail. This allows you to do it virtually. You can also magnify the image more than you could do it in real life and you can allow thousands of researchers from all, all over the world to simultaneously do this because there's also a Java web app that we have some examples on our website of this so that you can kind of have lots and lots of people looking at the same work and comparing notes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, so that same demo is online you can play with. Uh, and that's uh, that research actually we got to give credit is Tom Walsbender at HP Labs. Yeah, and we've worked um, with uh, Cultural Heritage Imaging. Yeah, in San Francisco. Also, yeah, in San Francisco on that as well. Okay, um, we do a lot in HDR as I know many of you do. Um, we uh, there's really probably not a lot to show you that you may not have tried here other than we just try to really max out our resolution and capture. We do use it for computer graphics and Christian Block is going to talk all about this in his uh, lecture tomorrow. Uh, as far as the ways you can integrate it into visual effects work, but this is a synthetic image as a panoramic background, but used with virtual camera work in a CG uh, car, but then lit by the same panoramic HDR image, and we can get really high resolution reflections um, onto the, the rendering of the car, which is really great for automotive. Um, probably not a lot of other industries, but definitely right. automotive. Mostly for CG work, they don't need really high resolution, but anytime you have something that's highly reflective, close to screen, you're rendering in high resolution, that's when the resolution of the HDR will be important. Okay. Uh, again, moving along, I think we have one more thing in then Yosemite, but this is a, another thing that Greg, of course, uh, specializes in in photogrammetry, recreating uh, geometry from images. And uh, there's a, a new uh, type of this using photosynth and uh, uh, basically, what do you call it, the high density? Yeah, so yeah, photogrammetry, you can either take a small number of photos and, well, at least right, the way it exists right now, there's, there's two techniques. You either take a small number of photos, do a lot of manual work to make those kind of mesh together and build up your 3D geometry and reproject the imagery, um, or there's a new emergent. Well, you, you can also do this from panoramas, which is, he's going through right mm -hmm. now. That's a panorama of a location. This is the 3D model uh, recovered from a textured with a photograph viewed from the outside of the building. Um, but it, it's basically a technique to take a, photos of subject from multiple angles and recover models. Now there's some new technology with programs like Photosynth where this happens automatically and it can also deal with large numbers of photographs. So it's kind of separated into this sparse photogrammetry and this dense photogrammetry uh, idea. And I'm sure at some point they'll, they'll kind of all be one thing. Okay, well we got about uh, 20, 25 minutes to talk about Yosemite. So this was a project that uh, came, up, came up a few years ago as a bit of a dream project actually because we love Yosemite. We shot some original images there in Gigapixel and uh, we, uh, you know, just couldn't get enough of shooting it. And then we got contacted by, as we began to put some of those images online, we got contacted by a geologist who's hired by the park, he resides in the park, and Greg Stock, and his mission is to study rockfall events. Um, one thing that, uh, if I go forward here and show you, uh, Yosemite is not a real safe park, actually. <laughs> and I didn't, I've never really thought about this until we got in this project, but this is all recorded rockfall, and there's other ge geologic uh, images you can look at that show you the extent of the runoff and so forth. But you know, there's been a number of, of uh, t uh, visitors killed over the years, so it's a it's a pretty hazardous uh, type of park. But again, when you have a lot of hanging uh, cliff walls like this, it's to be expected. Um, but in any case, he said, "Well, you know, I've gone back, and I'll show you this. This is Greg here, and what uh, this is showing some of the diagrammatic breakdown that he might do, trying to evaluate what happened." But the big problem that he has is when a piece of rock falls is that it pulverizes on the ground. So he didn't really, he can't compute the amount of mass or weight that may influence the release mechanics of that. So as a result, um, it's kind of a dark science uh, of a lot of speculation. So um, this is one of our early images that we shot at the diving board that you may know um, up in Yosemite a long time ago that we shot this. but. Um, there was a rockfall event in 2006, not too long after we shot that, um, right down the face of Half Dome. And this is some images shot by a visitor 
uh, watching the debris. Um, so Greg went back to this very same place that we shot and reshot it with the same focal length. And it's his shot on the right and our shot on the left. Here you can see it embedded into this, the size there. This is, a, this is a tremendously huge piece of rock. I estimate it's about 300 feet tall. So that's just a massive amount of, uh, yeah. of rock fall. And, and, and actually, this is also uh, worth noting. that This was not our intention in, in taking this photograph. We went there uh, doing an homage to uh, uh, Ansel Adams' black monolith. And we thought, oh, wow, it'd be great to go take a gigapixel from the same spot he shot his image from. So we watched the webcams and tried to match the shadows and do all of this stuff. And then we kind of had this surprise when Greg contacted us and said, like, your image is like the ultimate documentation uh, to study the rock, what happened with the rockfall. So it turns out that re-photography is his best tool because if he has a before and after, he can very readily calculate mass. And then that can tell, talk about release mechanics. Um, anyway, he basically said, can you do the whole valley for me? And I was like, oh, boy, we'd love to. How yeah. much money do you have? Yeah. And uh, well, I, I think he said something like, I want to see every crack and every pebble in the valley. <laughs> <laughs> Tall order. <laughs> so, well, obviously not, not a lot of budget uh, from the NPS for this. But there was some uh, funding available uh, through Yosemite Fund, and they supported us. But uh, he said, well, you know, and I said, well, I'll tell you what, maybe we can go through uh, several contacts that we have and see if we can get some corporate support. So Microsoft stepped up uh, to the plate for, for this and uh, was the primary sponsor of the project. And uh, of course this is a great way to integrate Howard and Matt and the rest of the HD uh, view crew uh, into the project. But in any case, what we, we did to do this, um, let's see, I think we can move on from here. And then the other thing, by the way, I gotta uh, do a big shout out to Gigapan because this project could not have happened without Gigapan. That was the only way we could have done this. We, we had three Rodeon uh, motion control heads. This required a mo motorized solution. Um, but we certainly didn't have 20 uh, you know, to distribute, nor is it that easy to train. So Gigapan was just emerging at that point, and we know Randy Sargent, one of the, the uh, key inventors, and uh, Randy graciously offered 15 of the units uh, to be used for the purpose of this project. So uh, really, really fantastic and you know, could not have been done otherwise because it was very easily trainable. The idea of what we wanted to do is shoot, uh, let's go to this diagram here, was to break out 20 teams and cover the valley simultaneously. And the reason for the simultaneous thing, it, to be honest, it wasn't really for science, it was more for art because I wanted to take all 20 and unify them into one massive uh, panorama of the entire valley. So I needed consistent light uh, to do that. So we needed a simultaneous capture yeah. of 20 teams. And the funny thing is when we got there, the weather was sketchy and <laughs> I had calculated what the vertical climb was, some total for all 20 teams, and it was 36,000 feet. So I told Greg, I said, boy, if, the, you know, if this doesn't happen this weekend, we're climbing yeah. Everest. <laughs> you yeah, know, as far as no, it, and, it, and it pretty much had to happen. And it had to happen that day because you know, Gigapan was gracious enough to loan us the Gigapans, but the next day they were being shipped to the Amazon for another project. So we had one day to yeah, make very this narrow happen. Window. And it, it, when we arrived in our camp, our camp was flooded from the previous day's rain, and it rained actually immediately after we finished as well. Yeah, so we, we very had, lucky. We had a very narrow window. And but in any case, so the idea, um, let's just go back here, was the, uh, so we'd end up with these 20 document, uh, documented images of high resolution. Yeah, and I think um, each one was about five gigapixels, so we had 20 location. Each one was gonna be 180 degree view with five gigapixels of photographic data. Mm -hmm. The other great thing is we'll talk about how it was used in the end, but also Yosemite Search and Rescue is using the data too to whenever they get a call, they can kind of preview an area. So it had a nice use for that. These are the collection of uh, vendors or sponsors that, uh, that donated gear for yeah, the event. Including and the IBRPA. IBRPA. Yeah, yeah. Of course, thank you very much. So this was, uh, yeah, really a lot of fun to, to pool together a lot of individuals to do something uh, uh, both fun and unique and meaningful, I think. But in any case, so we, we ended up uh, finally making it out there. This is Matt uh, Utendahl of uh, uh, Microsoft with uh, Howard. You could probably talk about this at some point, but the, uh, the rig that they've constructed from a Mead uh, astronomical mount, uh, probably the most rigid mount I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah. I think you could uh, blast that with about a 50-mile-an-hour wind and it wouldn't move. 
um, really nice. So that was uh, so we incorporated that. We incorporated uh, Ger Gerard Menard, as you know, who did the 17 gigapixel image of Yosemite. So that was a world record at the at, at the time. time. Yeah. Um, came out and he was sponsored by Color and so forth. But he had, he's a Pixorb owner, so he brought his rig out. So we had a real nice uh, collection of individuals and units. But anyway, we spent a day doing this training in the camp, and uh, this is uh, probably half of everybody that was there. And then uh, here's Howard, and we had, uh, so we did some basic training in the Gigapan, not, uh, you know, and that's the beauty of it. It's, uh, as I say, it's something I could probably teach my grandmother, which is, uh, there's really something to be said for that, because the way that we have been doing Gigapixel has been, you know, fairly challenging. Yeah. Um, I created a uh, kind of a hit list or a checklist that uh, each team could take out in a location just to make sure to ensure that everything was correct. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you after. And what was amazing is that, uh, so a lot of these people were not highly trained photographers. A lot of them were, were amateur photographers. They actually wore furry pants. Yeah, some of them came know, in right. and cost him. Um. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he ended up in a bear trap. Yeah, but, you yeah, know, yeah. That's the, uh, kind of the story behind that. Yeah, um, but what was amazing was that out of all these people, who had, none of them had ever used a uh, mechanical device, uh, uh, with the exception of uh, you know the folks from Microsoft and Gerard um, and ourselves. But uh, all twenty of them came back successful, so that was a, a real tribute um, uh, to the efficacy. Of so this is the day that we had. So the weather broke. We had some magnificent clouds. And uh, we did have to shoot at 1 p.m., which I know is the, uh, you know, we have a little joke that we call X-Res lighting, which is like the world's worst. Like nobody with any pride would ever shoot in it, but we kind of have to for Gigapixel, and that's getting all better with bigger digital backs, and, you know, we can shoot less images yeah. with faster same cameras, resolution, all that. So it is getting changing. better, but in this case, it was limited by the access time of having everybody hike and have time to descend as well without sending them far into the evening. So uh, this was the, so anyway. So we shot it at 1 p.m. for this, but uh, amazingly enough, and this is an IEPP member, Eric Beggs. I'm, I know a few of you know Eric, and uh, he joined in on this. Um, but the the beauty was all 20 images were created. Um, there wasn't really any errors made. Every gigapan performed flawlessly. Uh, we just felt very very lucky. We were a little stressed, I think, yeah. before this. Yeah. Um, and during. But, uh, but anyway, the good thing is, this is 45 gigapixels of data. It's all viewable online. What I'll do here is just uh, give you a preview. Now, I think the network in this hotel is a 28 baud modem going through China. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I, you know, this is not going to be a great demo. But um, this is what you can access from our site. And this was authored uh, with the help of Microsoft um, in Silverlight. And it just really shows off Silverlight's wonderful. Yeah. The deep, uh, use. deep zoom and Sea Dragon technologies, but as we actually let's go and where did you cache over? We yeah, cached a little. We bit cached a little bit. Uh, it is normally pretty close to the speed if you're on, I don't know, like residential DSL or something like that. Yeah, actually, this is but all just to show cache. you the de the uh, the details. So that's all. Um, and you can scour and find climbers. I mean, Gigapixel yeah. is just made for rock climbing. Um, but within this, you can explore each yeah. image and go back out. So you can see, just dive into another image and we'll just see like how quickly you can navigate the entire park this way. So for the folks who are researching this for to study rock art, uh, or excuse me, to, okay. to study the rock art. This is going art. over to China here, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, but this is very peppy on a, on a reasonable network, which is yeah. pretty neat. But, but the, what, what's great about this is because it's all in one single zoomed view, uh, we can easily look at any part of the park from multiple angles in seconds. And this is what the researchers find really valuable for using this as a documentation tool. So anyway, so that's the, this is kind of the end result of, uh, of that effort, but we weren't done yet. So I'll close that out and I'll just show you one last little thing on here. I want to have time to play our reel. Um, anyway, that's the, so anyway, this was the, where we kind of did the art part. We did the science part, now it's time to do the art. Yeah, technical art. <laughs> yeah, very, very technical art. Um, so this was, uh, uh, David said, in the, in the conversation with Greg Stock, he said, oh, by the way, we have a one meter LIDAR of the valley. And I was, oh, I just like, what? A one meter? I mean, most terrain resolution is 10 meter. So one pixel per 30 feet. And this was, of course, one pixel per three feet. So literally, you can see trails on this data. So if you look here at Glacier Point, uh, let me go out of here and I can get a mouse back. Mm. Uh, need a laser pointer. There you go. Uh, so here you can see even this is the four mile trail on Glacier Point coming down. Of course, you can see all the roadways and, 
and rivers and so forth. Um, but uh, really terrific piece of data. So um, we use that as an underlay to create, I think, a very novel image. So what I did is I took each, 20, uh, each of the 20 images into Maya, my 3D software, and then we tracked the camera position. So I took that data, a low-res version of it, and found out where each team shot and kind of recreated that. We also use GPS to, to mark the position. Yeah, so GPS. So this is one, one portion of one of the panos and then seeing what the data looks like if I render it. So this is kind of like this, the, the model version and the, the uh, pixel version. And then from that, we created a, actually the first CG slit scan camera. I know a lot of you know about slit scan. And, uh, so we, we got a programmer to write us uh, one that I could kind of fly down the valley on this path um, to, uh, in effect, unwrap the valley into one continuous image. Um, in the end, we rendered it. <laughs> Fortunately, well, it looked a little it too looked, crazy. Uh, you know, a little Fellini-esque. Uh, <laughs> it was a little Salvador Dali, so uh, we backed off from that. We rendered an orthographic view. So this is like a front elevation of a house, but in this case, it's Yosemite Valley. So you can see El Cap, you can see Yosemite Falls, all the monuments staggered in a row that you could never normally see at once. Yeah. So basically, because it's a U-shaped valley, you can never back up enough such that you can see Royal Arches and you can see El Cap, you know, that's right. in the same spot. So we were able to kind of back up to an infinite distance so you could see all of them lined up. So then, of course, the, the task, and it was not an easy task, was to take all those 20 uh, gigapixel images and embed it onto this. And that was where we rendered it. So this is kind of like little spheres that represent each team's image and kind of the position of where it looked in the model. And then here's our final image. And this is uh, what we'll unroll for you in a few minutes so you can come examine it. It's a 150K uh, image and it's all rendered, um, but it is photographic in nature. There's nothing synthetic in here. It's all based on real world data in every regard. But the interesting thing about it is it has perspective removed. So I think it may be the first orthographic uh, or non-perspective view of nature. I could be wrong, but I, the, one, the only one I know of. And it was definitely one of the early uh, uh, gigapixel rendered views. So not only did we use gigapixel coming in, but then we did a software render out in gigapixel uh, as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then this is the, the biggest print we did, the 40 footer, and this was, we put this up at SIGGRAPH. Uh, in their lobby, which is a lot of fun, because if you had it's a big been, graphics conference, if you if you love Yosemite and have been to Yosemite, people would walk up and they get really confused because they go, "There is no place where you can see all this." Um, and then people from Europe or what have you that may not have visited Yosemite, they just look in and go, "Ah, eh, it's just any old pano there." So it was an interesting uh, reaction that we got from different people, um, but a lot of fun. And we've shown this to rangers and so forth. I was wondering what the date of your picture. Uh, the date? It's in May. It was in May uh, as Memorial Day, I think. Um, I'm pretty sure in 2008. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you might be in it if you were there that day. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, anyway, one last little bit of this. We weren't quite done, and this was uh, the one last thing we wanted to do. Now, I used to fly these years ago. Um, I was a competition pilot and all that. Don't do too much of this anymore, but... Um, anyway, Yosemite has a wonderful... Uh, it's probably the penultimate place to fly a hang glider. So we had an interesting situation where some of the DEM data or the terrain modeling that I showed you was taken from an aircraft looking straight down. So therefore all the cliff faces were just kind of like smeared down. There was no way to see detail um, up into the cliffs. So Photosynth had just come out and uh, we had uh, been investigating that. We thought, well, maybe we can have a hang glider fly an aerial survey for us with a few cameras that are on intervalometers and just have them shutter hundreds of images on a flight path and then we would have something we could create a 3D model from photographs. From. Initially we had other ideas like we're like, oh, we'll just fly a plane. The park said, that, no, you have to be at 15,000 feet to fly a plane over the park and then they said, oh, well, we'll do a balloon. They're like, no, no balloons. How about a kite? No, no kites. <laughs> so in the end we found out about that they, one, uh, during one hour of the day, every day, they allow a hang gliding flight. So that's kind of how so we're able to get our aerial images. What we're looking at here is Photosynth, and many of you, I'm sure, know this, but here I'm seeing uh, all the, uh, this is uh, Glacier Point, of course, and if I hit uh, P on the keyboard, I can see just the 3D data um, of a point cloud on this. So this is the actual 3D reconstruction of the valley uh, made from this collection of images. 
And it uh, turns out it had an area of rockfall that, or showed an area of rockfall that very much interested Greg Stock, the yeah. geologist. And, uh, you know, they do also use uh, ground-based uh, laser scanners, and they point up at the cliff and, and scan. But the difficulty is that there's not a good commercial scanner that can actually scan the entire distance, so it can't see the top. Uh, the top of El Cap because uh, all laser scanners have uh, distances in which they work well. You can either get a very close range one or a very long range one, but there's not scanners that work well for that distance. And these show you all the many images that, uh, that Barton took, our fearless pilot. Um, but in any case, so let's, uh, we're almost out of time, so let's uh, move on to the last. And anyway, that's, that's pretty much it on this. The, the good thing about it in the end is that, well, it's not good. Actually, I don't want to say it's good. The well, it's good for die. <laughs> fortuitous thing is that there's been three major rockfall events since we did this project, and every one has uh, been, according to, to Greg Stock, very beneficial. This one actually closed down 300 structures at Curry Village, so if you can't get a campsite there, you can blame us, I guess. But they, uh, they and Curry, as you may know, is a very actually hazardous place to stay because it's right under the highest incidence of rockfall in the park, and we're, they're trying, there's an effort underway to get uh, Curry Company to move it. Um, which, you know, probably needs to be done. But in any case, this was one that happened just a few months after we completed, and this was the most destructive rockfall in Yosemite history. Greg was able to calculate as a 210 foot by 36 by 21 slab, so just an enormous uh, piece of rock. It destroyed all these cabins. Thank God no one was, was injured or killed. Boulders ran right down into Curry Village, as you can see. Um, and they elected to finally close yeah. 300 of these. Yeah, so, and, and that was, they said that it was a directly due to the influence of the imagery that we captured for this. So here's a before and after, and now you can break in. We've, obviously this is zoomed out, but you can uh, go in in great detail and study this. And these are some others that Greg's given me uh, where he's gone back and re-photographed this. Some of these are a bit more subtle, but if you study them, you can, can see the, uh, the differences. And this is one that uh, took place actually by Royal Arches, and. This is a rather interesting geometric uh, break on that one. Uh, so it's you know proven to be a, a great thing for them, and you know I do want to thank everybody. I'm sure there's a few names in the room that that uh, participated, and we we thank you greatly. It was just a lot of fun. I'd love to do more of this, um, but yeah, we'll uh, find some more sponsors. We'll, we'll do more. <laughs> that's right. So if we have, I think we have five minutes. Is that right, Don? Yes, five. Five. Okay, good. So I'll just. Uh, no, 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 we'll do the print we'll do the at the break, but the, uh, what I'm going to do here is show a little reel, and this just kind of encapsulates some of what we talked about, um, but, uh, uh, but in motion. Here, I'll do this one. You can talk about a little bit of this, Greg. Sure. So we also do lots of time watch work, uh, visualization of the gigapixel work. So this is an early uh, study from the, the Pixorb. Here's the clouds rotating around. Now one thing, uh, well, go ahead. Yeah, so this, this is on the Microsoft Surface. Um, so uh, this was, was kind of a new thing right about the time that our project came out. So Microsoft was very keen to get this uh, on the surface as a demo, which we thought made it a fantastic demo. It was so much fun to just use that uh, pinch and squeeze technique to zoom into the image. Uh, this is, uh, I think at the time, this was the world's largest uh, 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 display wall, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and that's at UCSD. And the, you can see the flash with the lasers that I mentioned before. And if you play with this relighting, there's also one that you can download as a separate uh, object. Uh, or a separate application that will run faster locally. The Java applet that you'll find on our website is a little slow. Uh, this is some dome theater work. This is from Tikal, Guatemala. Uh, this is from our Crossing Worlds film, so we're revealing the geometry with that little flash of a mesh there and some of the CG work we've done using panoramas as backgrounds and for lighting. And, we got uh, lucky on this day. 
It's <laughs> <laughs> a stroke of luck on that. Here we've integrated CG water and cannons. And, and this is based on a very low resolution pano I shot on a family vacation at that uh, fort. Mm. Again, you can see the geometry there. Now this is where we're mapping it on a geometry and moving a camera yeah, in. So this, this would have been, uh, imp this shot as well, would have been impossible uh, using a real camera rig because this would have required a helicopter to move this distance. This is just uh, locked and on. This is just yeah. some of our straight uh, time lapse. Uh, this is a shot that I did for an IMAX uh, called Magnificent Desolation, and this is a, involved a lot of stitching of Apollo 15 uh, panoramas that they shot with Hasselblads. And then we mapped those and put them on 3D geometry so you could actually fly through that trench called the Hadley Ryle, uh, which they only looked into. And this is just kind of a standard CG shot. Okay, and then this last little bit I think next is uh, on a project we did for uh, the National Park System in Dayton, Ohio and the Wright Brothers. And uh, uh, we keep coming back and doing a little bits of work for them. But this was a lot of visual effects work. Uh, but the point on this is that this was done with a lot of panoramic backgrounds. So what we're seeing here is actually a spherical pano for the virtual cinematography. This is live action because we have the actor, but a lot of the, uh, the other backgrounds are panoramic in nature. This is a pano, and a pano here. This we shot green screen. There's a, a, a group of enthusiasts that build these aircraft and try to fly them, so it's kind of scary. But uh, we uh, happy to have that. And this is an all CG shot, and then uh, done with uh, panoramic uh, and assistance. I don't think they have that climb rate, actually. <laughs> but we took some yeah. liberties. Okay, great. Okay, so, good. Um, lastly, the, I think when there's time during a break, um, I'm not, there's not time now, right, Don? Well, we're breaking for 15 minutes. Oh, right? we're, we're... Yeah, we'll end. Oh, we've got a couple the minutes? Break. Okay, yeah. well, why don't we bring up the house lights, and we brought the, uh, the rendered view that is the combination of all of the uh, gigapixel images, um, and we brought a big uh, print. This one's 30 feet? This is the baby one, but it's yeah, 30 this by is, This three. is not the full size, but it's pretty big. We all get one of those, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone gets one when you leave. Yeah, email us. <laughs> okay, well, thanks so much.